Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. Well, I'd say the drying out is already starting, but it's been going on since this morning when we had a lot of rain in spots. Now we're looking ahead to a toasty weekend, and we are not just pushing 80s, folks. We are cruising into the 80s by Sunday. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you here on a Friday. Take Ashley Barrissey's word. Things looking up now that we get past that morning rain. That's right. And so we will get another little chance for an afternoon shower storm to develop very isolated. Yeah. yeah. But, but the temperatures will be on an upward swing just in time for the weekend and overall a pretty dry weekend ahead. And we'll talk more about the details of that in just a moment. But let's take a look outside at this lunch hour where we're still holding on to some pretty thick cloud cover, but we're sitting at 70 in Detroit, 69 in Pontiac. 66 in Port Huron, degrees shy of 70 in Monroe as well, and light and variable winds across the board. Now the bulk of that moisture, and there's quite a bit of it, has now pushed off into Ontario. A little bit of moisture throughout Lake Erie, but a lot of that really impacting Ohio towards Pittsburgh and throughout the Ohio Valley. Let's zoom in because we're starting to peel back that cloud cover. So for folks west of Jackson towards the Lansing area, getting a little bit of that sunshine, and we'll continue to fold back that cloud cover throughout the afternoon where we get a few peaks. We're calling it partly sunny, but really mostly cloudy at points with a chance for some redevelopment into the late afternoon, early evening evening. I'll say five to eight is more of that window where you could see a pop up, but 77 degrees for the afternoon high. We'll walk you through that weekend forecast in just a moment. Can't wait for that. All right, Ashley, a special ceremony happening tomorrow, honoring the lives of hundreds of babies. The Aaron Grove Cemetery Association has come across records showing more than 100 infants buried without the proper markings. Nick Monticelli shows us the hard work that went into this process. So this is the angel garden that we're talking about. It used to be just grass, not a single marking here. And so people started doing the legwork and realized that there are records and there are babies, babies buried down here that nobody recognized until they found that paperwork. The Aaron Grove Cemetery in Roseville has been here since 1855. And as with any cemetery, there are plenty of stories to be told, but few like this one. The realization there's at least 100 babies buried here without recognition. This whole project started because you were trying to identify plots and see where you still had space for people. Yes, exactly. And then that. it turned into this. Yes, that's exactly right. Beverly Bishop has been working for close to a year. We just looked for Erin Grove, Erin Grove. Matching records between funeral homes, the county, and the little burial records left finding between the 1950s and 70s, hundreds of babies that weren't with us long are buried here now. And until recently, without even a marker, nobody knew they were here. As you went through this process, was it an emotional one or, or were you on a mission or, or both? It was very emotional because I was like going through those records and circling Aaron Grove, Aaron Grove, and I was like, how many could this possibly be? At that time, the medical community was nowhere what it is now. So a lot of these deaths are just natural things that they couldn't take care of back then. Right. The records were just like all over the place. There were just a lot of manual records, cards, notebooks, handwritten, nothing really <laughs> complete. Dave Curran grew up working in the cemetery. Now he lives in Pennsylvania, but from a distance, has taken on the administrative rules, restoring Aaron Grove Cemetery. We've got a cemetery filled with, we'll say, adults, right? Does this mean that just a little bit more to you? Oh yeah, a lot more. Because the, the, these are people, the, these are children who, who never were recognized. That's all fixed now with the creation of the Angel Garden, honoring the little ones. But it's not just about honoring them, it's about reconnecting. You've taken the time to, to try to reach out to some of the families. How have those conversations gone? Really interesting because many of the parents are gone now. They had their newborn baby in the 50s, sure. so um, they would be like 90 or so. So some of them we found, but more or less we found siblings who said, what do you mean I have a sister or a brother? Well, yeah. those are the same parents. So, so are they happy to hear from you or is they it? They are. Right there is Fitch, Kathleen, Dawn, Fitch. They were ecstatic. They said they always knew that they had a, a sister and now they know where. So they were like anxious. They That's came right out. They had no idea. That's incredible. So yes. they came out and put this, this marker here 
after you contacted them. Yes. So tomorrow there's going to be a dedication and prayer ceremony for the Angel Garden, praying for the little angels many had forgotten. We would like to commemorate them and maybe we could get other family members to bring in headstones and and make it more full, filled out and, and who belongs to who. I, I can't stress enough, people today need to learn that life is life. You know, that these are babies, no matter if they were born and they're only a day old or they're five months old. So again, that ceremony happening tomorrow. It's going to be at 1130 here in the cemetery. The address is there on your screen, but it's basically at uh, I-94 and Little Mac. Back out here again, here is that garden. I do want to point something out, though, because they did all this work. They made the markings and then they found more records. So there's another plot a little further on back there. And they are talking about continuing with this process and again, organizing everything. So they will do more of this if it becomes necessary. We're in Roseville, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Yeah, just a wonderful effort. All right, Nick, thank you. Two Detroit police officers charged in a child abuse case involving one of the officer's own children. Investigators say the crime happened in Genesee County on March 1st while the officers were off duty. Jared Shaw and Liana Shaw, both 35 years old, are on suspension. Prosecutors say they're facing assault and child abuse charges for assaulting Liana Shaw's children. The police department's internal affairs department handling this case with help from Flint police on this. Uh, they are both due in court on the 30th. The cousin of Zion Foster will return to court June 3rd to learn his sentence. The jury needed less than an hour Thursday to convict Jalen Brazier in Foster's murder. It brings to a close a saga that's gone on for more than two years since Foster disappeared. Her body was never found. Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy praised the jury's verdict, saying her team spent 18 months building their case and linking the evidence to Brazier in order to secure a conviction. Southfield police trying to find two women who they think were victims of human sex trafficking. This is a new development in a case that started with a police chase out of Southfield, ended with a crash in Detroit. Investigators got a tip about the sex trafficking at the Red Roof Inn near 12 Mile and Northwestern Highway. Two suspects now facing charges. If you know anything, give, give police a call or you can call Crime Stoppers and you will remain anonymous if you do so. First Lady Joe Biden and second gentleman Doug Emhoff will take part in a community listening session in the Upper Peninsula this afternoon with the Bay Mills Indian community and the Sioux tribe of Chippewa Indians. Also this afternoon, they will tour the Sioux locks before heading to Midland for a political event. President Joe Biden will be in Detroit Sunday as the keynote speaker for the NAACP Fight for Freedom Fund dinner. That's at Huntington Place. Michigan Stadium set to begin alcohol sales this fall uh, for football games. Anyway, last October, the Board of Regents voted to ask for a liquor license at Michigan Stadium, as well as Yost Ice Arena and Chrysler Center. Alcohol sales began at the other two venues already. The Regents decided to implement a liquor license at the Big House now, and it comes after a review of the alcohol sale rollouts and the fan experiences at both Yost and Chrysler. Sales start August 31st with a home football game against Fresno State. It's opening day for the United Shore Professional Baseball League at Jimmy John's Field in Utica. First pitch set for a little after 7 p.m. tonight. The game features a matchup of the reigning champs, the Utica Unicorns, versus the rugged West Side Woolly Mammoths. The stick and uh, make sure you stay, stick around after the game. They have fireworks going off tonight. Tickets are still available, and of course, we know lots of family fun to be had there.